44 degrees. If you were with us in our last program where I had Paul Sane as our guest, then you know what we're in store for today. Uh, you're not going to want to miss this program. It is a program that is going to be packed with Scripture and is going to deal with a subject that all of us need to know more about so that we can protect ourselves and our family. In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. The Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, Flee also youthful lust. The Apostle Paul there is, is writing to young Timothy. And I think it's interesting that he phrases it as youthful lust. Well, we know that young people can struggle sometimes with the lust of the flesh, but we also know from the other writings of the Apostle Paul that, that lust is something that can uh, impact um, a person of any age. In fact, I remember a story about uh, a man who was on up in his years, and he was asked on one occasion, uh, how old do you have to be before you're no longer tempted? To which this man, who was getting pretty close to 100 years of age responded and said, well, you'll have to ask someone else older than I. And of course, the point was that that's something that we always struggle with. If you were with us in our last program, you know that I sat down with Paul Sane of Sane Publications, and, and Paul has been a good friend of this program, and he's uh, been a gospel preacher for many, many years. And, the, and, and Paul, in, in recent times, has done some study on the subject of, of fornication and what the Bible teaches about it. And we just had a great study with him in our last program, and I wanted to continue that in our program today. But before we go over and sit down and talk with Paul, let's watch this next segment together, and then I'll be back. Heavenly song, Thank you for viewing the fabric song, of family. Flooding my soul with if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Or you may contact us at our website, jhcc.org. Song, That's jhcc.org. Or you can call us at 256-764-6291. That's 256-764-6291. Our hope and prayer is to bring you and your family closer to God. Well, we're glad you're with us for our panel discussion. And uh, as you can see, we've got Paul Sane back with us. Well, Paul, we had a, a very interesting discussion last time you were on the program about uh, the subject of fornication and adultery and, and uh, what the Bible teaches concerning uh, these two terms. And uh, I want to to explore this a little bit more with you, and um, I, I suppose thoughts. maybe we could get started by just simply noting some scriptures that maybe come to mind that deal with these subjects, and um, kind of lay the groundwork as far as the seriousness of our topic today. It's an extremely sensitive and emotional subject that we're talking about, and I know that some people basically almost just close their ears at the mere thought of even talking about it. Mm -hmm. But if we respect this book. Mm -hmm. If we know that it's God speaking to us today, that which must be adhered to, John 12 tells us that the words that are found in this book are going to judge us one day. And if we understand that we have a soul and this book is that which is going to judge that soul and our eternal destiny is determined by how we live, then when we read in the Bible, profound statements. I mean, undeniable. I mean, you can't argue with. For an example, and I've got some here on my iPad. Sure. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. 
to what it says, Paul talking to the church at Corinth. Well, 20, 30 years ago, I walked in the streets of Corinth, old Corinth, and saw even some of the signs of the wickedness of that city, even as it was in the first century. It was known as a sexual city. In fact, the phrase oftentimes was used, Corinthianize, and that meant make it sexualized. Well, Paul told these Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to go to heaven if you're unrighteous. Now, someone might say, who's he talking to? Well, he didn't leave doubt in that matter. He said, be not deceived. I mean, don't pull the wool over your eyes. Don't be deceived because neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind now, back to the first phrase. No, don't you know? No, you not. You surely are aware is what he's saying, that you're not going to go to heaven. Mm. That one verse alone is enough to draw a conclusion yeah. beyond a shadow of a doubt. There are many others. For an example, in Matthew 19, where Jesus referred back to the beginning when God created man and woman and said, this is the design of God. One man, one woman, in marriage till death you do part. And don't as it were, go out and fornicate with someone else, or commit adultery with someone else. But at Colossians, one more, let me yeah, go deal with that. In Colossians 3, verse 5 and 6, where again, Paul is the author, but God is the one that inspired these words. And he was writing to the church at Colossae. And he said to them, mortify. Now, that's not a word we use today, but what it means is kill kill off. What is he talking? Mortify therefore your members, the parts of your body as it were, which are upon the earth. What is he saying? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he says, now keep in mind, fornication is a part of this. He said, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. God's wrath is going to come upon us if we're guilty of sexual sins and we cannot go to heaven. Yeah, and you think about uh, fornication and you think about uh, adultery and some of the other sins that are mentioned there. And, and God takes such a hard stance against that. I mean, you, you, you can't be any stronger than to say, if you do this, you're not going to go to heaven. Exactly. And, and, but yet, we in society in general, and sometimes even within the context of the church, take these things so lightly. Do we not? Yes, we do. And certainly, as you mentioned, even within the church, there are those that go to church on mm -hmm. worship on Sunday, and meet with the church together, mm -hmm. the people, and maybe sing, Oh, how I love Jesus, or I mm -hmm. sing to me of heaven, and other similar songs that speaks about serving God faithfully and serving Him acceptably and ultimately wanting to get to heaven. And I've known of those Monday through Saturday who have had relationships with those that are not their spouse in a relationship sexually that is certainly not approved by God. Yeah. And how can you harmonize that? Well, well you can't harmonize it. And, and so basically you have uh, two categories of individuals. Those who engage in these type of activities with other people that uh, they're not married uh, to and have no right to engage in. And then secondly, I think another area you need to think about here, too, is those maybe who will say, well, I'm going to be married to this person, but as far as Scripture is concerned, they don't have a right to be married to them Correct. at all. Correct. Is that not fornication Absolutely as well? so. In Just other, because the court says you're married, does that make you married? No. Oh. And that which man calls common law marriage. Mm. But at the same time, when we look to the old law, the standards that were set then, the way in which they were pronounced as it were husband and wife, and we need to be willing to make that commitment one to another and to be married in God's sight. Not just, I've often used the illustration as far as the triangle. There's the husband, mm -hmm. there's the wife, but God is to be the head of that home, the unit, united 
condition between that man and woman. Mm -hmm. But if they're out shacking up, that's the phrase that I've heard almost all of my life. They're living with someone that's not their husband, not their wife. They're engaging in sexual activity. That is explicitly condemned in Scripture. Well, let me, let me ask you this question because sometimes this is raised. Let, let's take a situation in which uh, a man and a woman, um, they get a divorce. Let's say that the wife puts the husband away uh, because he was running around on her. And um, so after being put away, the man says he's penitent. He wants the wife to take him back. She won't take him back. Uh, so in the process of time, he ends up meeting somebody else. And uh, he gets married, as we oftentimes say, to that uh, other party. Um, can he live in that situation and be okay as far as God is concerned if he was penitent over his sin? All sin can be forgiven no matter what sin we have committed, including adultery. But there are consequences of certain sin, and God has spoken concerning that one that has been guilty of adultery. There is in that, adult, uh, in that relationship, here's husband and wife. I've often said, here's Joe and Jane. And let's say that Joe has an affair with another woman. He's the guilty party. Now, Jane is the innocent one. Oh, she may have failed. Everybody fails in some way or another. But as far as the vows to her husband, sexually especially, she was faithful. He was not. Can she remarry if the two of them separate, have a divorce because of that fornication, because of that adulterous relationship? Yes, she is innocent. And Jesus says that she can. Now, what's the passage that Jesus... Matthew 19. Okay. In fact, I have it in front of me here on the iPad. And beginning in verse uh, 3, we read, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. They're no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God hath joined together, God is the head of that home, let not man put asunder. But verse 9 in particular, where Jesus says, I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Here's Joe and Jane. Jane puts him away because he's been an adulterer. He's had an affair. And she can't get up. It, you know, just because there has been a breakdown of that home doesn't mean that marriage has to cease to exist. I know of many that have worked through that, reestablished that love and bind and trust together. They stay together. But let's say that Jane can't, and she puts him away. He does not have the right to marry again. In fact, what Jesus said, whoso put it with his wife, except it be for fornication. Well, Joe was guilty of that relationship, that sexual immorality. She put him away for that, so she has that right. But Joe does not. And in fact, it even goes further and says, and shall marry another and committeth adultery. He, if he marries another, commits adultery. But then even more tragic, what the Lord said in the latter part of verse 9 is, and whoso marrieth that individual also is in adultery. So not just the one that has been guilty of that, but he can involve someone else in that as well. Yeah, it can have a great effect upon the souls of many. Uh, we've got more to talk about, but I, I think it's about time we'll take a break in our discussion. We're going to watch a segment, uh, A Word for the Family, with Charles Abernathy, and then we'll be back to finish up. Great. Hello, friends. My name is Charles Abernathy. I'm the minister for the Chisholm Hills Church of Christ. And I want to share a word for the family for just a moment. I, I, I don't know when you read Scripture what you think about the people who actually listened to Jesus when He taught. One of the amazing things to me, and as I was reading Luke 15 not long ago, I, I read where sinners and tax collectors, along with religious people, were together listening to Jesus teach. As I read through Luke 15, it dawned on me that people who were nothing like Jesus actually liked Jesus. I think what's even more amazing than that is that people who were nothing like him and actually liked him 
Jesus seemed to be fond of as well. He seemed to like them as well. There are a lot of different kinds of people in the world. And I, I don't know what you think when you think God thinks about you. And God does think about you, friends. He loves you. I think that's the most important message we get from Genesis to Revelation. And I want you to know that whatever you're going through right now at this moment in time, maybe you think because of your activities, God doesn't care much for you. That God doesn't think of you at all and certainly could not love you. Well, that could be no farther from the truth. God certainly loves you. And that's expressed in Luke 15. He tells three different stories in one parable in Luke 15 about things that are lost. He gets to the climax of that parable and talks about the lost son. In that particular parable, the lost son who has lived a life of sin decides to come back to the father. So what does the father do? The son is nothing like the father. He's lived in a sinful lifestyle that is uh, against everything that the father stands for. And what does the father do? He takes his son back when he comes home. Understand that in that parable, Jesus, as he teaches sinners and tax collectors and religious people, some who were nothing like him, and the ones who were somewhat like him but in their hearts were far from him, Jesus actually loved them. And he told that story to communicate that beautiful truth. I hope this word for the family has helped you today that regardless of where you are, know that God loves you and he wants you back. Well, Paul, it's good to be back in our discussion time, and we want to finish up um, what we've been uh, talking about today on this program, Fabric of Family, uh, dealing with the subject of fornication and adultery. This is such an important topic that we've actually uh, taken a couple of programs just to, to try and, and deal with it, and, and then even doing that, we've only touched the hem of the garment. Wow. We could spend a lot more time. But I want us to kind of begin to shift our attention now to... Uh, the home specifically and, and, and how that uh, fornication uh, can destroy the home uh, and how we as Christians can help to ensure that this is not something that uh, we have to deal with in our own home one day. You know, we live in such a sex-obsessed society. I mean, we can't turn television on much of the music, videos, movies, magazines, anything and every radio, all of it. Anywhere we turn, there is that which is blatantly being thrown at us and the mentality of Hollywood, as well as those that are singers of music, oftentimes is it's all right to divorce, it's all right to have an affair, it's all right to do what feels good and, and goes from there. But it's not, God has spoken. So we live then as Christians in a world that need to prevent ourselves, to make sure that we take the actions that guard or, or help protect us from that. In other words, if I, have, have, if I am a person that has a particular problem with one thing, then I need to get away from that one thing. And Satan knows areas in which we might be tempted or vulnerable. For an example, I've never been drunk. Alcohol doesn't appeal to me at all, never has, even as a teenager. But I know some who just can't be around that or it'll destroy their lives. Yeah. But the same is true in sexual matters. Man is created a sexual being. Man has temptations and it's how we respond or refuse to be around those situations that can keep us from getting trapped into that and ultimately destroying our homes. Well, so what precautions can Christians take to ensure that uh, fornication or adultery does not uh, creep into the marriage relationship in the home? I don't have a list of things, Barry, but first thing comes to my mind is no more limitations. In other words, if it's something that is a, uh, a concern or a tempting avenue for us, 
When we go to Walmart, we go to the grocery store, a drugstore, whatever it may be, out in public, and we see someone that is scantily clad, almost naked, we need to turn away and get away from that. For an example, in the Old Testament, David, when he should have been in battle, he was at home, went out on the roof of his house that night and looked down and saw Bathsheba bathing. If David had merely just gone back in his house, that would have been the end of it. But it didn't end there. He looked, he lusted, he sent for her, and a child was conceived as a result of that. When we see that which, because we're human, we're not superhuman, but we're made in, you know, in the way that God made a male, we can, if we allow ourselves, can look upon a woman and lust. Jesus himself said that, didn't he? In Matthew 5, 27. But whoso looketh unto a woman and lusteth after her. In other words, he sins because of just lusting in just the looking in that way. All right, so uh, there's some, some good uh, information for uh, men. Of course, the same would apply to women as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Uh, wh what about, uh, I, I mean, y y you can't get out of the world. Uh, I mean, you have to live in the world, and you know, we we go to work. Um, you know, you go you go into your job, and 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 say there's someone there. I mean, can you just leave work? I mean, what what, what can you do in a situation like that in which you're struggling with that? I had a Christian couple talk to my wife and I some time ago, in which she described her workplace. And one particular man there kept coming on to her and trying to get her to do things that should not have been done. But she had to get very blunt with that, to get away from that. She didn't have a desire to that, but it could have maybe potentially have led to something. But I know of certain situations also where maybe a woman on the job, and maybe she and her husband are kind of at odds during this period in their marriage. Maybe they're not getting along real good. But here's a guy sitting right beside of her and he's got that kind, listening ear. He cares as a friend to her. He's so understanding. He, he sympathizes with her. And this woman, if not careful, can say, man, I wish he were my husband. I wish my husband was like him. I wish he cared, just my husband cared as much and would listen to me and be empathetic in that way. In other words, we can get ourselves in situations on the job, next door neighbors, whatever it may be, that we need to run away from, get away from, before things get out of control. In Genesis 37 through 50, we read about Joseph. One segment of Joseph's life was when he was in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife came and tried to seduce this young man. I remember vividly, and I'm, I know you do as well. What did he do? He ran away. Yeah. He even ran out of his coat, as it were, yeah. to get away and saying, I can't commit this sin against my master, Potiphar, or against God. He recognized here was an evil temptation. Maybe she was beautiful to look at. Maybe she would have been something that a lot of people would have thought wonderful, the opportunity. But he knew it was a sin, mm. and we've got to get away from it. <laughs> you know, there's some people, they talk about how they struggle with this or struggle with that, and uh, not trying to minimize a, an actual struggle someone has, but uh, I, I, sometimes I wonder if, if that's really the term we ought to use because... Uh, some don't seem to struggle, they just simply seem to give in without yes. the struggle. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, this, this is something that uh, a lot of people do struggle with in their life. Mary, before we go maybe through the end of the program, let's, let's deal with the homosexuality side of it as well. Okay. And the idea of men that say they lust after a man, okay. a woman that lusts after a woman, that also is condemned so vividly in God's Word. Mm -hmm. It is a perversion. But I've had an individual, a member of the church in fact, that sat and talked to us and made this statement, God made me that way. Oh. I have desires toward another man. I ended up telling him, I don't know the details medically and all of that without going into all of that, but I do know this, 
that if we have any desire, whether it be toward a man, or if I am desiring looking upon a woman that's other than my wife, it's sinful. And I've got to refuse, I've got to disallow myself from doing that on any situation. So any activity sexually. Fornication is called in the Bible. Mm. Sexual immorality with anyone other than what God says I have the right to do so. What can couples do, married couples do, to ensure uh, that these temptations do not uh, befall the husband or the wife? What are some things they need to think about in their marriage? Two words come to my mind, and that's understanding and communication. If I understand my wife, and if she understands how I am built different from her, if I understand her, she's built different than I am, and if I understand that, I'll, as a, as a wife looking to a husband, she'll meet his needs and make sure that he doesn't look to someone else for fulfillment in that way. Communication is the second word, though. I've got to be open with my wife and she with me to make sure I understand her needs and meet those needs and vice versa. In 1 uh, Corinthians 7, where Paul said, render due benevolence, it has to be an open communication to do that. So understanding and communication. I think are two key words. Well, those are some excellent thoughts. Uh, Brother Paul, we've not exhausted our subject, but we have exhausted our time. And I want to thank you for being with us on the program Honored. today. Maybe you can come back on another occasion and we can uh, talk about some other matters related to this. Be perfectly great too. Thank you. Heavenly Thank you for viewing the Fabric of Family. If you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address Using is 1031 Hermitage Drive in Florence, Alabama, 35630. Or you may contact us at our website, Music recognition. CC. No we were unable to find anything. That's jhcc.org. Or you can call us at 256 764 6291. That's 256 764 6291. Mansions above, singing his praises gladly. I'm walking. Our hope walking and prayer is to bring you and your family closer Jesus to God. Well, in no way have we exhausted this subject, but I tell you what. I want to thank Paul Sane for taking time to explore what is such a needed and important subject today, the subject of fornication and adultery and how this can have a great impact upon our homes. I'm Barry Gilreath, your host of Fabric of Family. I want to invite you to tune in again next time on this same channel as we continue to address family matters from a biblical perspective. Let's make the most of a minute. In a certain village, there was an elderly man who was stone deaf. However, every Sunday morning and evening, he was seen going to the services of the church. One Sunday morning, one of his neighbors stopped him and, with the use of sign language, asked him why he always went to worship when he couldn't hear a single thing that was said. The elderly man replied, I want all my neighbors to know which side I'm on. It'd be a much better world if everyone who professes to be a Christian had the same attitude that he wanted everyone to know whose side he was on. Attending every service of the Lord's church is one certain way of letting the world know whose side you're on, Christ's or the devil. Hebrews 10, 25 of the Bible commands, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Whose side are you on? I'm Glenn Colley from the Church of Christ, hoping you make the most of your minutes. Selected. Screen recording. Button.